<laughs> My colleague said they're getting really nervous now. I just want to first uh, say thank you so much for coming out. We tried to find a time. I know many of you are cabbing right now, so we wanted to find a time that might work for your schedule, but I know that there's some uh, significant challenges that many of you are facing in the agricultural sector. I know food security is something that is very much on the minds of so many people. I know that regulations and permits and all of those challenges have really made it difficult for so many of you. And I know that change needs to happen. And so a couple of things, maybe just housekeeping, that there is, oh, our, and our, MP came. Todd, great to have you here. Can I, why don't, yes, come on up, Todd. Pull up a chair. You know what, because, um, and actually, you know what, I saw the mayor here too. Why don't you come, Ron, why don't you come up here as well? We're talking agriculture, but we're talking solutions. So why don't we get all levels of government up here? Because you know how we solve problems? We solve problems by working together in the caribou. Thank you, not to put you on the spot. We'll get you a water and, yeah. Yeah, and we're all here to listen. Um, I just wanted to, again, say I know that there are some changes that have happened on the legislative front that is causing some significant challenges. We're here right now um, to take some of these challenges back to Victoria. We are in a process right now that's called estimates, so as we speak, Ian, your estimates is up later in the week, so it's perfect timing to take the questions that we hear today and ask the government. I remind people two things. First, um, if you have issues with Trudeau, talk to Todd. <laughs> you got issues on the federal front, since we do have, you know, since we do have Todd here, if, if there are federal issues, if you are open to bringing them back too. Um, I think that's important, and on the provincial side, we're in opposition, um, so as much as we would like to make the significant change, um, the challenge is, is our job is to hold the government to account and to um, raise the issues that we are having uh, today, uh, each of you, when it looks at food security, and this specific topic on this town hall is on the agricultural sector. Uh, I have to tell you, um, Ellis got up at 3.15 this morning, 3.15 to come here, um, to come from Terrace, uh, because he knows how critically important it is. Ian, I know, Ian, you were up at, I don't know, 5.36 to come up here today because they know how important um, this topic is. And more importantly, we also know how each of you have always thoughtfully come forward on how we solve the problems because we can all complain and say this isn't working, but let's come forward and bring out some solutions and take that back to Victoria. Um, so with that, I think I'm just gonna maybe pass the mic down and let each of my colleagues introduce themselves and say a few things, but I'm, I think it's critically important um, just to say something publicly. Todd, you have been a incredible partner and supporter. We've worked uh, closely together on this very, very, very large riding. Your riding is even significantly larger. And I just want to say publicly in front of everyone how much I've appreciated everything that you've done. I know that I think we're busy, and then I look at your schedule, and I know everything else that's, that's going on. So. Um, on behalf of all of us, we just want to say thank you so much for making the effort. And I'm going to pass the mic to you to start. Yeah. Wow. Um, thanks, Coralie. Um, hi, everyone. Um, uh, where do we start? Um, well, this is our home. Um, Raised, born and raised in the region, and uh, grew up fighting, you know, uh, Williams Lake versus Quinnell, Williams Lake versus Prince George, Quinnell versus Prince George. Um, you get used to scrapping, you get used to, to fighting for those. If you can't hear me, sorry, I'll, I'll speak up. Um, and so you know, when we get thanks for doing the things that we love to do for the families and the friends and the families that we love and hold so dear, um, it's a lot of work, but uh, um, 
I couldn't think of uh, a better team that we have, whether it's yourself, whether it's Shirley, um, uh, Mike Morris, uh, Ian, and Ellis. Uh, I'm so proud to be from this region and with the people that we have. We have Mayor Paul here as well, too. Um, but we do have some serious concerns, a lot of concerns. There are things that are should strike fear in all of us. It's harder for us all to make ends meet. Uh, at the end of the day, we are seeing our, our paychecks go um, not as far as we would hope. There's less and less money in the bank. We're seeing our streets uh, become riddled with crime, with drugs. Uh, we're seeing an attack on our corner store and industries. Um, I remember a day when we could go up and down the street and you see the little signs that say, this family proudly supported by forestry. We're proudly supported by farming. And it's making it, it's harder and harder for those of us that have families in those industries for them to make ends meet. So it's all right for us all. I know we're all big fighters here and believe in our region, believe in the people here. Um, so getting up at 3.15, Ellis, uh, I don't know if it's public, but uh, uh, you might have to get used to getting up at 3:15 when you're making the when you're making the commute to Ottawa. Let's hope that we have uh, another strong voice in Ottawa. That's what we do, and we do it because we love all of you. We really, truly do. Um, and uh, regardless of the political side that you're on, uh, we, we fight every day to make sure that you as as our friends and our families have a, a better way of life because we, we truly live in God's country. I, I believe it. And uh, it's easy to do. It's easy to get up and do. I think my riding is uh, 90, 92,000 square kilometers. Um, and it's getting bigger. Um, but uh, it's it's not work when you, um, when you love what you do and love the people that you're fighting for. So what makes it harder when you have people that are across the way, whether it's our provincial counterparts or um, the guy that I sit across from that uh, have never had to work a day in their life. They don't know what it's like to work and depend, uh, live paycheck to paycheck. Um, and their policies are making it harder and harder. Our carbon tax is going up 23%. April 1st, April Fools, uh, but that's happening. Um, as I said, our, our streets are riddled with crime and drugs, all, all because of the policies that our government are, are taking place, and we have to do better. We have to make sure that we're always putting Canadians first and putting our, our friends and our families first. That's what I fight for, and that's why I'm here today. So thanks. Thank you. Ian is the Shadow Minister of Agriculture, as I mentioned before, and his estimates are coming up. Ian, maybe say a little bit about you and some of your history. Um. Okay. Usually when I get on a microphone, I'm auctioning something off because um, I'm a professional auctioneer. My dad and I had a farm auction company in the Fraser Valley. Uh, and I became partners in McClary Stockyards in Abbotsford with Soren Jensen and Charlie McClary back back in the day. So I haven't been in that for a while. But uh, since I got into politics, I've had to basically step down my farm auction business. So um, we're here today to talk about uh, lots of agricultural issues, I hope. And I hope to hear from you folks about some of the issues that uh, you have. Just to tell you a bit about myself, uh, my name is Ian Payton. Uh, I'm proud to say I'm still living on the farm I was born and raised on 67 years ago in Delta, of all things, right on the uh, dike of Boundary Bay. My, grandfa my grandfather uh, came out from Scotland and bought the farm about 1938 and <clears throat> was a dairy farmer. My dad was a dairy farmer and I was a dairy farmer. So I milked a lot of cows and uh, we didn't pull all our calves this time of year. We pulled them all year round. So you guys are, you guys are slackers. You only got to pull them for a couple of months. We, we pulled our dairy calves all year round. Just kidding. But um, anyways, yeah, so came through that. Um, our farm auction business was part, as you guys know, farming. Uh, dairy farming for myself and my wife was uh, something that wasn't necessarily full-time. Most farmers nowadays have to have some sort of secondary income, and that's just a fact of life. 
Um, you know, I talk all the time about how difficult it is to make a living farming, especially in British Columbia. You know, w up here north of the, par the 49th parallel, which is the border between the United States and Canada, when you think about it, if you're a farmer, uh, we're competing with California, Mexico, Arizona, and people down there are basically planting and harvesting and farming 12 months of the year. Up here, you know, a lot of the months of the year, we're sitting in the kitchen staring out the window at the rain or the snow or the ice. So it's a little different for us up here trying to make a living in the agriculture industry. Um, as you guys all know, um, you know, the cost of production just keeps going up, uh, the cost of inflation, and then interest rates. You know, I'll tell you in the, my area, the Fraser Valley, the dairy farmers, it's a pretty good, pretty good industry. Guys are making pretty good money. And they went out when interest rates were like half of 1%. They're going, hey, I'm going to buy a brand new Klaus harvester, a John Deere harvester. I'm going to put up a brand new couple of barns for heifers. I'm going to buy some more quota for my, uh, my dairy herd. Uh, I'm going to put in a huge pivot irrigation system. All these things they spent money on. And all of a sudden, interest rates go to 7.5%. And these guys are sweating bullets because... Uh, the price of milk hasn't really kept in line with the cost of uh, inflation and the cost of interest rates going up. So I'm sure all you folks are facing a lot of the same things. I talk about the three Fs, the feed, fuel, and fertilizer. So feed, I, the one thing I enjoy about my role as the shadow minister for agriculture is I get around the province, and I really enjoy that. So this summer, for instance, I'm... I'm in Cranbrook, I'm in the Kootenays talking to cattle uh, producers in the Kootenays, I'm in Fort St. John, Dawson Creek, Chetwin, uh, Williams Lake, uh, over on Vancouver Island. Every summer I go to different places, so I get to meet people like you. And uh, last summer, I mean, my goodness, um, being up in Fort St. John and Dawson Creek, you know, guys that are usually getting, um, you know, six round bales, big round bales to an acre, are getting uh, two and a half round bales to the acre. Uh, Vol Jones Auction Market in Dawson Creek, never seen so many cattle, same with Van Vanderhoof going through. I mean, just unheard of numbers going through at a very odd time of year because people going, jeepers, I don't have enough round bales, I don't have enough feed to put these cattle of mine through the winter. So, you know, they put them, thank goodness, the price of, uh, of steers and whatnot and, uh, and cows were, have, were, was quite good and, and they continue to be quite good. But yeah, carbon tax, uh, BC United, um, let's face it, uh, our leader Kevin Falcon, you know, just recently said, look, not only are we going to take carbon or the provincial tax off of fuel at the gas pump, so you'll save 14 and a half cents a liter when you fill up with gas or diesel, but we're going to take off the carbon tax on all agricultural fuels, whether it's a, uh, your grain drying up north or whether you're running a greenhouse down on the coast or buying diesel or buying propane or whatever for your farm. So we would take the carbon tax off, which has got to ultimately help with the cost of the production for farming, but also the price of uh, groceries uh, in the grocery store. So many things to talk about. I'm sure I'm going to get lots of questions from you. I'm all over um, the issue of the Agricultural Land Commission and our land reserve. I think it's very broken right now. There's been no budget increase whatsoever in the last uh, several budgets to the Land Commission. They've got six enf enforcement officers for the entire province. We're seeing so many ridiculous things happening on our agricultural land, uh, especially down on the coast where I'm from, but nobody seems to mon be monitoring it or looking after changes that are happening for the worse uh, on our agricultural land. And I also believe, you know, before government changed hands, you guys will remember, up here that we, we had created a zone one and a zone two. And I honestly believe that farmers have to have the ability to have a second income, and I really believe, see my dad, by the same name, I'll, I'll back up a bit, by the same name, Ian Payton, was chairman of the Agricultural Land Commission right towards the end of the Socred era, uh, in the late 1980s, early uh, 1990s. So my dad and I talked a lot about how farmers in this province need the opportunity to expand their opportunity to make a living. And whether it's secondary, you know, you, a lot of you guys might be in the logging industry. So we have to give farmers in this province the opportunity to make some extra income, whether it's agritourism, 
whether it's uh, creating a shop on your farm to repair logging trucks, it's uh, parking some logging trucks on your farm, if it's uh, down on the coast, it's corn mazes, it's Halloween festivals, it's Christmas time stuff, we have to open the doors for farmers to be able to make some sort of secondary income besides what they're actually doing. So we've got to lighten up some of the rules within the Agricultural Land Reserve. Water management, all those kind of things, crown leases, I'm sure we'll talk about a lot of that today. So anyways, thanks for having me up here. i got to tell you, I've been to a lot of places in BC, but I've never been to Quinell, so this is really cool that I'm in Quinell for my first time. Thanks, Corley. They're already solving problems over here in the corner. Um, Alice joined our team in 2017, and it was uh, Alice and I sat next to each other in the legislature, and we keep getting moved around into, po into different areas, but we always have the opportunity uh, to sit next to each other and share lots of experiences and, um, and how rural economies really work and how um, the importance of understanding the incredible power both positively and negatively on policy and how it can absolutely have a significant impact on people's lives and um, Ellis has brought so much uh, to our team I know he's gonna uh, bring that same you're lucky Todd to have that same um, wisdom and experience uh, in Ottawa but boy our team our caucus uh, has sure benefited from your experience. And so, uh, Ellis, would you like to come forward and, and to say a few comments? Thanks, Corley. I'm just pointing out the Ian Payton. She didn't say that about Ian Payton. She said it about me, though. Hey, guys, Ellis Ross. I'm, uh, I'm not a farmer. I know very little about agriculture. In fact, that's why I depend so much on people like Corley and uh, Ian Payton to fill in the blanks for me. But I do understand what unfairness is. And what you're going through right now is only a taste of what's going to come in the next five to ten years. It's going to get worse, I'm sorry to say. And this is documented in the B.C. government's websites in terms of what they're planning to do. And they're going to go after everybody equally. If you haven't found out by yet, just uh, up to now, they've got a plan called the Clean B.C. Plan. And in it, they've talked about how they're going to scale back the economy across B.C., to the tune of $28 billion annually. And they've, they've gone so far to categorize where they're going to cut back. And agriculture is a land line item. I believe it's $500 million they plan to cut back in agriculture. They plan to cut back on transportation, oil, gas, infrastructure. $28 billion they plan to cut back on GDP. And why we know this is because the BC Council of BC uncovered this by digging into the, their website and they found the numbers that the government had produced. So they published them. And now the government's denying it. But it was the government's own analysis. Further to that, they intend to cut back family incomes by $11,000 annually. It's, it's not a great outlook for anybody, including First Nations. I'm First Nations. I'm from Kitimat Village. So far, we got through the worst of this because we had LNG, LNG Canada. $40 billion investment, the largest in Canadian history. But it's coming to an end. Within a year, we're going to be in the same boat as everybody else, economic-wise. Site C is coming to an end. Trans Mountain Pipeline coming over the border from Alberta, it's coming to an end. There is nothing on the books to keep our economy going. So as the BC government now starts to scale back all the different resource sectors, including agriculture, and there's nothing else to build up the economy in except for taxpayer-funded economy, we're, we're in for a ride. Not necessarily us, but our kids are in for a ride. Our grandkids are in for a ride. We got the largest deficit in BC history now, $8 billion. And no way to pay that off except going after more taxpayers' dollars. The interest payment alone on this deficit is at a minimum $165 million. Is that right? $3 billion a year. Three, sorry, $3 billion a year. $4 billion, sorry, $4.1 billion. Interest payments alone. Think about this. If you ran your farm or your household, I guess, 
and you overextended yourself and you couldn't make the interest payments on your, your debt, you'd go bankrupt. Well, that's where BC's heading. And nobody's talking about it. The people are going to have to deal with it as our kids and our grandkids, and a lot of them are leaving BC right now because there's no future for them. There's even speech police happening right now where there's in a regulation, they're talking about how it's offensive to use the term British Columbians. It's in their documents. We brought this up in the legislature. It's not offensive to call ourselves British Columbians. I don't care where you come from. It's a great province. We shouldn't be tearing it apart like this. Uh, we've, we've already talked about a number of issues in terms of what's happening in our towns. Terrace is no different. Prince George, the crime, the drugs. We understand that. But a lot of those drugs are actually government supplied. It's called hydromorphone. Dilaudid. The kids call them dilly. And if you have kids or grandkids, I want you to go home and I want you to talk to them. What do you know about dilly? There's a term that politicians use called diversion. What it means is the Dilaudid is supposed to be for the hardcore drug users that might die if they use fentanyl. But the problem is it's not a controlled substance. Government is actually giving out these drugs and the drugs are making it into the drug trade. And so these are ending up in our neighborhoods. It's even ending up in Alberta. There was just a bust on the Vancouver Island there a couple weeks ago. 3,500 government-supplied drugs were found in the bust. 10,000 Prince George. This is happening in our schools. It's happening in our neighborhoods. It's not a controlled substance anymore. It's dangerous because Dilaudid is an opioid. It's not going to kill you, but you're going to get addicted. I tried to start a campaign in Skeena to talk to kids and parents and say, look, we got to understand the lingo. Because we dealt with marijuana, acid, mushrooms in our day. The drugs today are 10 times, 20 times, 30 times more powerful. They're more addictive. And you don't know what they're lacing it with. I'm really concerned. I'm, re I'm very worried about our next generation. Uh, the last thing I'll leave you with is uh, I'm very economic-minded, by the way. The reason my band and a lot of different bands that got connected with LNG, the reason why we got out of poverty, the reason why we stopped depending on government money was we got fully engaged with economic development. I'm very proud to say there's no really such thing as unemployment in my community because everybody got a good paying job. And nobody wanted to complain about government anymore, but that's coming to an end. And all what I'm seeing all across BC is that we can't get mining permits. We can't get natural gas permits to get the gas out of the ground and to get them out so we can ship it off to Asia. And we can't get forestry permits. Over 30 mills across BC in the last few years have either shut down or curtailed their operations. And this government, who says they have forestry workers' backs, is going to transition those workers into another job. What kind of job? There's no other jobs. I really feel bad for the communities who have nothing. They worked their entire lives in forestry, probably generational. But now they got to leave. They got no choice. So they got to pick their kids out of school. They got to get a house in the United States or Alberta. That shouldn't be happening. So I, I cover a lot of ground, but my, my background is really economic development, especially when it comes to resource development like mining, LNG, oil and gas, anything that keeps a community alive. That's my interest. So thanks for having us. Thanks, Ellis. So this is your town hall. This is your opportunity to bring forward um, your concerns, your ideas uh, to the team, um, and we'll do our best to answer any questions that you have. Um, well, sure, the good, good, yes, well, you know what? I, okay, hi everyone, I'm Coralie Oaks, the MLA for Caribou North, soon to be the new riding of Prince George North Caribou. Uh, my family came here in 1933 um, to Moose Heights. A lot of Moose Heights folks are in the audience today. 
Um, before that, actually, uh, my dad and I found this. Um, we we were delivered this amazing box of my great grandmother's, um, who one of my cousins had, and it was uh, uh, Ida Lindstrom, and she. It was her journey from Sweden over to Minnesota, Minnesota to Alberta, Alberta to Vancouver, Vancouver to here, and all of that had all of the information in it. So it told quite the story of the journey that our family had. And in each of those communities, it was about, um, it was about agriculture. And the problem happens when something happens to a community and policies change, people have to leave. Right? And I've talked to a lot of you. And I know that there's a lot of scared people. And there's a lot of concern. And rightfully so, because for so many of you, you've been here for generations. But what we're here to do today, to say we're fighting back, we're fighting a back against the government. Because at the end of the day, you've worked for generations to pass on to your kids a better future. And this is the first time, the first time where we're saying that we're not passing things on better for our kids. And we should be paying attention. So with that, um, I'm gonna open the floor for some questions because I do think we can solve it. So Rick, I'll let you, if you can kindly Hi, thanks very much for the opportunity. I'm Stuart Fraser, I'm from Nazco. I'm a guide outfitter. Been there since uh, 78, two generations. And I can't pass this on to my kids because there's nothing there in this province for us. I have three asks. The first ask, I heard about the carbon tax and I'm disturbed that you're gonna cut the carbon tax for agriculture only. Ax the tax for British Columbia, period. Get rid of it, it's killing us. You ax a tax, interest rates, everything comes down. We all know this. Second ask, abolish UNDRIP. That is killing this province. We are all for First Nations reconciliation, but this is killing us. I have family and friends in Nazco <clears throat> that don't even talk to me anymore. This UNDRIP has driven a wedge between us, and I'll say us, and our First Nations friends and family. It's gotten out of hand. When they pass it on because of these court cases, they never give an instruction book, and the way that it's going is killing us. It's killing this province, it's killing this country. That has to go. And I need to know what your position on that, because I'm talking to the other parties as well. And there are four acts and under it and acts and attacks and all the same thing. I need to know yours because I voted for you last time. And I'm a conservative. And I voted for you guys last time. So if you want my vote, we need some hard answers and we need some solid answers and we need some future going forward because I was on the phone call the other day with David E. B. Town Hall thing and I was looking through their forestry stuff and they're going to subsidize all these mills to retrofit to, to, to produce small logs. I mean, they're, how much smaller log can you produce? They're gonna, we subsidized the forest industry off our backs for the last 20 years. And the forest companies and their shareholders made billions and billions of dollars. Get them to put the money back into the province and pay for their own way. Because this is killing us too. Our taxpayer dollar going to subsidize these mills. It's gotta stop. I also wanna say, Thank you for the work that you're doing on the side of guide and outfitting. I think all too often when we're talking about industries and we talk about natural resources, guide and outfitting has been a critical economic driver for us. And I know your family's been involved for many years. And I want to thank you for that. And I know that during the fires, things were really challenging. I also want you to know that before this meeting, we did go and we met with Lataco First Nations. My concern with this government is they're trying to divide us all. 
They're putting inflammatory language so it is dividing us and making us point fingers at each other instead of us saying we've got to start pointing fingers at the government. I'm worried because when you start looking at the maps, and, and Ellis can do a much better job of describing what is happening around the Land Management Act and UNDRIP and the challenges that the government is putting in place that is trying to make us divided. It is making us divided. You're right, absolutely. Um, I, but I, I don't want any of us to come away and start pointing fingers at each other. And that is my fear. That is my fear by what this government is doing. They're trying to pit us against each other. And that is wrong. And so, Ellis, would you maybe come in and, like I said, you presented to Lataco today and... Okay, I'll, I'll leave the, the first issue for last. Uh, but in terms of forestry, I agree. There's a simple solution as opposed to subsidizing forestry operations. Issue the permits and let them log. That's it. We don't need a royal commission to figure out why logging is getting shut down across BC. Let them log. If you want to change it to address wildlife issues, fine, that's doable. But don't shut down the entire industry and then use tax dollars because at the end of the day, what's going to happen? We're going to have to import lumber to build our houses from Alberta, United States, who did not shut down their logging. Uh, I'll talk about UNDRIP. Uh, my background is basically rights and title based on Section 35 of the Constitution. And when I first read about UNDRIP probably 10, 15 years ago as Chief Counselor of Heise Nation, I said, we don't need this. We've come so far as a country to address Aboriginal issues already, and it's working. We're lifting people out of poverty. We're making the province stronger, LNG, forestry, mining. But UNDRIP was brought in anyway, and we, I debated against it. Now, I'm going to say something that's probably contradicting to what you probably heard from other political parties. It doesn't matter if you get rid of UNDRIP. Keep it, get rid of it, it won't matter. That's not the problem. The NDP government said UNDRIP is not legally enforceable. It's an aspirational document. It's an interpretive aid, whatever that means. What I, mean, what I think it means, the government can use it when it benefits government. That's what it means. If you read UNDRIP, it's just a framework document full of principles. You can't enforce any of it. And so First Nations had to go to court to find out that UNDRIP passing the BC legislature is not even worth the papers written on. And I'm so sorry to First Nations who have to go to court to find this out and spend all that money. Because we spent 40 years in court to get to a point where everything that we did benefited BC. The problem is a secretive initiative called the Land Management Amendment Act. They tried to secretly do this. And they didn't attach it to UNDRIP. What they said was, we're going to actually share the decision making on permits with First Nations. Now we don't have to go too far to find out how that is wrong. The BC government last year signed an agreement with Blueberry River on a land management agreement. And guess who's taken the BC government to court? Halfway River and Doig River First Nations, the neighbors to Blueberry. Because those First Nations claim that all their territory was given over to their neighbors and all the permits and all their authorizations is under a veto. Even though this government said all along there'd be no vetoes. We're waiting for this court case to unfold because I'm pretty sure the BC government's going to fail unless they settle it out of court somehow. So First Nations, if you think UNDRIP is going to benefit you, or if you think that the Land Management Amendment Act is going to benefit you, you got another thing coming. Because, like our colleagues say here, the government's trying to divide us. They're trying to divide First Nations as well. They're trying to put First Nations against First Nations. What I've been going around BC, don't take the bait. This is not your neighbor doing this. This is the NDP government. 
It's what they did with the Caribou Action Plan up in the piece. The same exact thing. And there's one piece of court case I want you guys to remember what government's ignoring. They're supposed to make decisions on every single issue with society at large. First Nation, non First Nation alike, they're supposed to do it with all of us in mind. If anything, they should be having town halls to talk about their land management and amendment acts. And at the end of the day, it's government's responsibility to issue a permit, to issue an authorization. It's their duty. And they're not doing it because they're playing politics with Land Management Amendment Act or UNDRA. Uh, the last thing I'll talk to you about is acts of tax. Uh, carbon, the carbon tax. I agree. The time has come to get rid of it. Now, BC, uh, our party's already said we'll get rid of it. We're the party that brought it in. But it, 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 it's, it's fulfilled its potential. Now that times are tough, we got to go back and actually help families out. But we can only get rid of the BC portion. The BC government does not have, any BC government does not have the authority to get rid of carbon tax if it's Ottawa imposed. We can get rid of the BC portion. In fact, we can even limit it. Did you guys know that uh, the NDP gave LNG Canada a carbon tax break at 30 bucks a ton? So while our carbon tax goes up, the biggest corporation in BC right now, LNG Canada, theirs will stay at 30 bucks a ton. That's not fair. So we'll, we'll, we'll do what we can to get the carbon tax. By the way, the NDP have said no. They're just going to keep raising the taxes. They're going to double it this year. But for the other portion, you need somebody in Ottawa that's promising to get rid of carbon tax across the board. And I think that's where Todd can actually fill in the blanks for us. Thanks. Um, but first, I just want to say this. Uh, it was probably 10 years ago, maybe a little bit longer, that I saw Alice speak at the Natural Resource Forum on behalf of, um, of uh, his community and others. And uh, he said this. Uh, it might even have been that where you said, we don't need UNDRIP. We need government to get out of the way for First Nations to... To, to be able to see uh, prosperity. Uh, you also said this, if there are drug issues or, or substance abuse issues in my community, it's on me as a leader. It's not on the government of the day other than myself as a leader within the community, which really resonated with me. <clears throat> Mr. Fraser, I, it's absolutely heartbreaking to hear your, um, your intervention today. I hear that. I, I've lived it also in my community and in, in uh, or in my region. Uh, my wife and my children are from Estela, First Nation. Side by each four generations, and all of a sudden now we're warring with our neighbors. And as you said, we can't look each other in the eye. We don't talk to each other, even family members. We've seen government uh, over COVID even. Vax, non-vax. Uh, it's crazy how this, these governments have divided, the, our current governments have divided Canadians, have picked winners and losers. And it's, it's shocking. Leadership is about bringing people together. Leadership is about making sure that this family is as pros prosperous as this family. Everybody has the equal choice. And all we have seen that if you don't agree with whatever dogma the government of the day has or the current government has, then you are uh, unacceptable. Why should we tolerate you? That's what our prime minister said during COVID. Why should we even tolerate these people that are, are choosing um, uh, their own bodily autonomy? Re regardless of what you feel about vaccination or unvaccination, I don't care. I, I see you as a person. Right, and, and so we have government that has done that. Um, so that is that on UNDRIP. I feel that I feel very strongly about uh, UNDRIP as well too. Um, and I've worked uh, in Parliament regarding this. When when I was first elected, I, I still I think have the book, uh, the small book that United Nations produced on on UNDRIP. And you could have ten lawyers around the table, and those ten lawyers reading that document are not going to be able to come to an agreement on it. And you have First Nations there, 20 First Nations around the table, and, and they will not come to an agreement on what UNDRIP means for their individual First Nation. 
It is an aspirational document that was created by an unelected board or unelected group, the United Nations. Does it have some good stuff in it? Absolutely it does. But it, does it have stuff that targets good people like yourselves that actually, if you've got a, a provincial or a federal government that are saying that we're, we're legislating that, you have essentially put a not open for business sign up in our province. It has chased away industry. It has chased away opportunity. Can you honestly say that we are better off in the last four years or the last eight years with this government? Maybe in some areas. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm big enough to say, yeah, maybe they've done some good things. Every government probably does some good things. But honestly, as a community, as a country, as a province, are we better off? No, we're not. This tax, the carbon tax, it has done nothing to, to lower the greenhouse emissions of our province or our country. We have governments, our federal government and our provincial government have set aspirational goals, goals to reach these targets, and we are not able to reach these. The greenhouse gas is not doing it. But what is it doing? It is punishing everyday uh, Canadians. If you ax, or if you tax the farmer that produces the food and tax the trucker that ships the food. Who ultimately pays that price? All of us. That's what the carbon tax does. If you read the little policy documents, the little, the fine print in the carbon tax, what is it there for? To curb consumer intentions or tendencies to stop you from driving or fueling your I have a diesel pickup. I'm not, not even ashamed to say it. I'm sorry, but I don't have an electric vehicle. I don't. And we have governments that are saying that all new vehicles have to be electric by what? What is the date? It's crazy. It, where we're going to plug it in, right? Anyways, listen, uh, I didn't come here to campaign on... I've got two years yet. I hope you guys vote conservative. But uh, our leader, Pierre Polyev, is very, very clear on what we're going to do. We hammer it home every day in the house. If you follow question period, which maybe there's three or four of you that watch, we've got four things. Our first one, we're going to axe the tax. Then we're going to fix the budget. Because as Alice said, we can't spend. You know, we can't run a country like, like the money is growing on a tree in the back. That's exactly what they're doing. Creating more money, printing more money. And how, what happens when you do that? Well, inflation goes up. So we're going to axe the tax right away. Then that makes the provinces, they're able to do the same thing. They can follow suit. We're going to fix the budget. And we're going to build new homes to make sure that we're, we're going to set policy that, so that more homes can get built. And we're going to... We're going to stop the crime. That's what we're going to do. But Axe the Tax is number one. If you haven't heard it, I guarantee if you turn on Pierre's feed any day or ours any day or any day of the week, that's the number one thing we say. We are axing the tax because it is absolutely punishing Canadians. So you'll have a federal, you'll have the next prime minister that is committed to doing that. And we'll do it within, this is the first thing that we're going to do. So. So, sorry, just to be clear, as I said earlier on, this is not an April Fool's joke. That carbon tax, your federal carbon tax is going up 23% on April 1st. Yeah. And Scott Moe, Saskatchewan, is the first, the first province to come on board to say that they're standing up to our federal, our federal, uh, our gov federal government to say, we're not going to do it. We're not punishing Saskatchewan families anymore. That's, that's a lot of courage to do that, but it just takes one. Uh, 
Hi, my name's Sage Gordon. I live west of Quinell, out halfway between here and Stuart Fraser's place. I'm a small producer. I worked in the logging industry, mining industry. Been here for near 40 years and in the logging industry for 30 of those. Um, but the other day, plus I'm a small business owner and a small producer. So, and the president of the yeah, yeah, and the president of the Cattlemen's Association here in town, in the area. Um, I, I have to, um, like many of us in here, we run a small business or side income off of our property or off, you know, or we work off property because we have to, to pay for our farming, our ranching, you know, for, for our industry. I had to sit down the other day and I have to figure out what I can charge my customers and still make a living just to cover my, my expenses. And with the, with the taxes going up, carbon tax going up April 1st, it comes down to $100 between what I get to put in my pocket, which ends up in taxes because come the end of the year, I'll probably make too much. So it's like, and that goes for just about everybody here. How, how do we stay in business? I wanted to expand my herd. I couldn't because of the hay shortage. So, financial decision. I sold half the herd. Smart decision. <laughs> Wrong. You got, we got puni I got punished for it. There's nowhere I can get support to get hay. Oh, you can, you, we'll give you money to buy back the, you know, to buy back so you can build your herd up. $100 a head. What is that? That's less than 1%. That doesn't even cover my expenses to pay for buying back what I sold. Like, so there's this government, year, even a few years back, went as far as saying farmers and ranchers are non-people, non-persons. And now they're running the, the small guy and the family farms out of business so that the big corporations can control, they have more control over the big corporate farms that's what they want. Where's our food security? They cry, food security, this is what we need. You know, food security, it's the best thing going, yet behind the scenes, they're cutting our throats. <laughs> I mean, you know, here we are. We've, we thought we had a good working relationship with our native neighbors. Now, all of a sudden, the government says, oh, no, you can't do that without first coming to us. While well, you go to the government to try and deal with something where you could have gone straight to your neighbor and dealt with it, now you have seven, eight, 10, 15 people. It takes two to 15 years. Some of it's still being dealt with. We're tired of it. Let's go straight to the source. Let's deal with it. We want to make money. We don't want to make killing off of it, off of our livelihood. We want to make a living, pay our bills, and help others. We can't do it. We can't hardly even keep ourselves afloat. Come on. Like, we need, we need something fixed. And badly. I, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Getting back before I get to that question, and thank you, a very solid question with some interesting comments that are very true. But as Alice said, with the, to the gentleman that spoke as the guide outfitter, I want to make it very clear that I did talk about carbon tax, that we've talked about carbon tax coming off of our agricultural fuels and agricultural use. But as Alice said, we have our own carbon tax in British Columbia. The federal government mandates carbon tax to all the provinces pretty much. Um, if there's a change in government in a couple of years from now and they take off the federal carbon tax, we have said we will take off the carbon tax in British Columbia as well. There's no way we're going to let other provinces have an advantage over us. And don't forget, even now when we're competing agriculturally with 
Washington State and Oregon and California, they don't have a carbon tax. They don't have a minimum wage for employees. We're, we're being penalized by trying to produce food here in BC versus Washington State and other US states as well. So that's another topic. And the other thing I want to talk about is there's a lot of talk here in the room today and everywhere we go about the BC Conservatives. We're the official opposition, 26 of us. The Conservatives are only two. We're the official opposition. I can tell you, out of 26 of us in BC United, I believe there's 24 of us are card-carrying federal Conservatives. So we are the Conservative Party. We're right of center thinking from the majority of our caucus of BC United. So I can tell you, we're not way far to the right, like those two fellas, but we are right of center, and basically we're a Conservative Party. So keep that in mind. But I want to talk for a minute about the things you've brought up. And, um, you know, I do agree. I, I, I know what you guys went through this summer with your feed shortage. Suddenly, you got to sell off a bunch of cattle, and government goes, oh, wow, you're not eligible for agri-stability because you suddenly got a whole bunch of income from selling all those cattle. And by the way, you owe us a whole bunch of income tax for selling those cattle. Um, yeah, there's lots of issues now. A year ago, in April, or just about a year ago, there was a surplus with the BC government. And after the budget, there's a thing called supplemental estimates for the budget, and they threw an extra $111 million towards agriculture in BC. So the budget for agriculture for the year was around $111 million, but they added $111 million. Instead of that money going directly into the hands of farmers and ranchers and people trying to make a living producing food in this province, they doled it out to Investment Agricultural Foundation for $20 million for First Nations agricultural studies, $30 million for food security studies, $30 million for agrotechnology. Who are we trying to reinvent the wheel with? There's technology coming at us from all over the world. We don't need to be a leader in British Columbia on ag technology. Um, money for food hubs on Vancouver Island. So anyways, they kind of blew away this $111 million, and that is the kind of money we need as part of our risk management programs for guys that are suffering with drought, fires, flooding, all those different things. I hope that answers some of your questions, but I know, you know, I can tell you this much. Kevin Falcon, our leader, has been around the province. He's met with me. He He's... He understands, he, he's very sympathetic right now to what's going on with the BC tree fruit industry. We were just recently in Kelowna with the wine industry, the people growing apples, cherries. He totally understands what's happening with our, our cattle industry um, throughout BC. Um, you know, there's a lot to, to agriculture in BC when you think about all the different parts there are to agriculture in British Columbia. So um, definitely it's going to be something that we take uh, very seriously moving forward. Yeah, you know, uh, we're your voice in Victoria, but we're the opposition. But we do as much as we can to try to convince government what they're doing is wrong. And sorry to say, for the last seven years, it's fallen in deaf ears. I don't know much about what it takes to be a farmer, but I do like produce making it to my kitchen table. And that's why I rely on Ian Payton and Cora Lee to talk about the hardships that farmers are going through. But you know, it's very similar to what forestry workers went through in 2017. And we begged the government, don't do this. Because forestry matters to BC. It's the backbone of our economy. Loggers are going to lose jobs. Mills are going to shut down. Communities are going to shut down. Families are going to get broken apart. Don't do this. They did it anyway. So everything that we're trying to do, what really helps is your stories. When you write to us. And so we can't be just dismissed by government. No, they're just politicking. No, this was a letter from a farmer. This was a letter from a logger. This was a letter that couldn't get a doctor. This was a letter that couldn't get treatment. This was a letter from a mother who mortgaged her house to get her son into drug treatment. Your voice matters. And the more you write to us, the more we can show government we knew it was going to end badly. We told you for seven years it was going to end badly. And I don't see any light at the end of the tunnel for forestry, agriculture. I just don't see anything because this government's got a different agenda. And that the agenda's got nothing to do with us out here in the rural areas.
so I don't know if it's, it's clear to you, um, but it is definitely clear uh, to me um, after almost nine years of being elected. Uh, there's a war on our way of life. There really truly is, and it started in 2015 with the election of Justin Trudeau um, and the 106 or 108 third-party groups that helped him get elected. Uh, those are groups like World Wildlife Federation, uh, all these far-left um, third-party groups that uh, Tides Foundation, uh, and it's not... I'm not crazy to say that I've seen the research, I've done the research, and seen the evidence, um, where they've just, uh, their, their goal is to shut down Canadian opportunity, our energy resource, uh, our Canadian uh, natural resource sector. Um, we've seen it right from day one, where uh, they started the war on our forestry, the war on, a, on our oil and gas, our way of life. I see it in fisheries. When I had the fisheries file, um, you have the, the office of the prime minister that was some of the, the leading advisors were all, if you look at their pedigree previous to 2015, they were all World Wildlife Fund, the Tides Foundation. And so his payback to them after getting elected was to implement these policies to shut down our way of life, to make it harder for those of us um, to make ends meet, whether we depend on forestry, whether we depend on agriculture, whether we depend on oil and gas. We've got a new bill that's coming out right now, Bill C-50, that is the Sustainable Jobs and Just Transition um, policy or legislation, which is effectively a government-mandated shutdown of some of the most productive sectors of our Canadian economy. Uh, it's an anti-energy -en agenda. It'll directly kill over 170,000 jobs. Uh, it'll displace over 450,000 uh, Canadian workers in the energy sector, and it will impact 2.7 million Canadians directly. These are families. This is in our energy our construction, our transportation, our manufacturing, and our agriculture industries that they're targeting. So if you think it's tough today, can you imagine what it's going to be like for us later? I said it earlier on, whether it was the NDP government, whether it's our Liberal government currently, in eight years we've seen that great big sign about open for business that light's gone out and it's, we're not open for business anymore. And it's made it harder for all of us to get along and get going. And all they've done is when we speak up, they've ridiculed us and they've said that we're uneducated, uninformed, and we're spreading misinformation and disinformation. I'll ask you this again. Has it gotten easier for you in the last eight years or the last seven years under this uh, NDP government or however long they've been in? It's gotten harder to make ends meet. And that's wrong. And as Ellis said, the only people that, the only people that can actually stand up and do something. We don't vote people in government in this country. We vote people out. And so whether it's this election that's coming up this fall or the next election, if you want to change, make it happen. And and really take a look. Um, really have a look as to who is. Who is there for the ballots? We do not want to do anything that will allow this NDP government to come up the middle and, and take, provincially again, and take control of this province after this next election. And that's all I'll say about that. But Linda, uh, Linda Atkinson here. I would totally agree that there is a war on many things, and uh, agriculture is sort of next on the list, or it's, it's, it's on the list already. Um, my concern uh, as a cattle rancher is that the cow herd in Canada right now is 40%. The cow herd is 40% of what it was in 2019. And most of the, many, m m many of the, the calves that were sold last year went straight to the United States because they also are, have this war on agriculture down there. So. My understanding is that some of the cows in Europe right now have little bags behind their 
their um, tails in order to collect the methane, right? Uh -huh. So we haven't got that far yet, but there's a very good chance that usually that's what's coming. And you might be aware, you may or may not, because the media doesn't share it, but um, you know, the farmers in Europe are really trying very, very hard to oppose this. You know, the tractors are on the roads all the time trying to, to let people know. As far as the carbon tax goes, the problem I have with that is that they don't credit us for carbon sequestration at all. At all. Right? So, you know, on, a, on our farm, I'm pretty sure we, we, uh, um, we have a lot of trees, but we have also a lot of forage. By the way, they don't even look at forage, um, but it's a great carbon sequestration, right? So, uh, yes, we're, we're in a really serious situation that we have no idea about at this point. And I'm really glad to hear some of the information that you've been talking about. Thank you. So, Linda, you just reminded me. Thank you for that comment. So, I, I, I meant to, um, I really just came to watch and listen, not really speak. But now you got me out in my soapbox. So, listen, I, on, the far, on, the, on the forestry side, we harvest less than 3% of our annual allowable cut in this province. And we plant. For every tree that we, we, we cut down, we plant four to six. So, for them to say that we're in trouble, it's, it's total BS. On the farmer side, and, and we don't take into credit any of those trees that we're planting for carbon sequestration as well either, or carbon credits. And we don't, don't take into credit uh, our agriculture side. And we have the most sustainable and um, world-renowned agriculture and energy resource sectors in the world. This is why people want to, their first choice on the international markets is by Canadian. Why is that? Because of our sustainable practices that we do, whether it's our farming, whether it's our forestry, whether it's our oil and gas. But for eight years or nine years uh, in, in Ottawa and seven years in Victoria, we haven't had champions. We have people that apologize for our natural resource sector, apologize for our agricultural sec sector. What was Justin Trudeau's very first comment that he said on the world stage after getting elected? Canadians will be known more for our resourcefulness than our natural resources once he's done. Isn't that crazy? How prophetic. It's the truth. It's crazy. Prophetic as well as pathetic. George? I'm George Edwards. Is this thing on? Hello, hello. You don't need it anyway. Um, the question was, where are we all going to work in the future? It's called hemp. You heard of hemp? Hemp will solve 50% of the world's problems. Easy. Let's look back at hemp. Hemp will uh, replace pretty well all plastics. It's biodegradable. In the early 1900s, it was booming. Henry Ford made a car body out of hemp that was 10 times stronger than steel. You know how thick steel was back in them days? Look at your old vehicles. The government made a big announcement. Hemp was going to be the first billion dollar industry. Then guess what happened? They listened to lies, false information, and they shut it all down. And we've still been down. We still have to get licenses and everything. I can grow grain, corn, alfalfa. Uh, why can't I grow hemp? We need manufacturers for hemp. There's one in Edmonton, I believe, that does blocks for hemp, building blocks. We need... It does medicine, it does food, it does building. You look it up, it's endless what hemp can do. Yeah. It's unbelievable. And it's this here is hundreds of thousands of jobs I'm talking about. All these pulp mills going down? No pulp mill should be going down. It makes better paper than anything with no chemical. It's proven. Actually, that, George, you brought a really good point, and I know that there's hands on this side too, so we'll maybe start the mic getting it over here too. Um, but one of the things I just wanted to comment um, on the other very troubling 
thing that's been happening. Look, I know our family certainly benefited several years ago when we had the agricultural extension services uh, in Quenell. So those were the offices that helped you um, diversify crops to your your comments around hemp and just looking at different seed um, uh, that we could utilize. We're in a situation right now where under the NDP, they've grown the government so large. They've added so many people to government that at the same time, they're closing doors. Like, how many of you used to remember where you could go to an extension office and get help with permitting or get help with some of the challenges that you had? Um, because there used to be an office that would help you with research, that would help you with a lot of the things that were going on in the community. So we've grown government at the same time in our rural communities where we shut all the offices down where you used to go for help or they've moved them to Williams Lake, right? And so the challenge becomes you already live out in NASCO or you live out in Moose Heights or you live out in Baker Creek or you live out in all these areas and now you're expected to drive another couple of hours to go to get any sort of help. And then here's the other question, how many of you actually don't have connectivity? How many of you don't have cell service out in your area or any kind of internet? I, I know that there's a lot of you. And so here and now the government in their wisdom have decided, okay, we're gonna add all these regulations, we're gonna add all this red tape, we're gonna add all of these challenges onto each of you. And guess what? There's not gonna be an office that you can no longer go to help you with any of those permits, the regulations or the red tape we're adding. They're driving it all online and guess what? You don't have connectivity. And if by chance you don't fill out the paperwork that you were required, we're gonna come after you and we're gonna fine you. Right, so this is the disconnect that happens in Victoria. They don't understand that the majority of the people in our area don't have basic services that we have in Victoria. So to each of us, that's our fight. Our fight is they don't understand what's going on in our rural communities. And guess what, they're gonna figure it out pretty soon when we start seeing challenges with food security, which I think is gonna happen pretty soon. We have a couple more years like we've had. They're gonna start figuring it out, but we, yeah, of course. Do you have a, did you, oh, but Heather, Heather too, and then Bernie, because you've had your Let hand up for a while. I just want to quickly respond to Linda, and Linda, good to see you here today. Um, on your question, I want to talk about the cattle numbers declining, especially in British Columbia. And I've noticed in my flights around British Columbia in the last several years, going to small towns, and you're flying Central Mountain Air or Pacific Coastal, you're not that high. And as you fly into Williams Lake or Vanderhoof or whatever town it happens to be, you look down, and my observation is I'm seeing properties that you can still see the fences, but you look down and you go, there's no livestock anymore. Like, what's happened to our livestock numbers? Even the person that only owns 10 acres or 25 acres, that you know damn well they used to have some cows and a few steers and whatnot. But the reason everybody's gone out of it is there's nowhere to get them slaughtered and cut and wrapped. And until we push, and I was on a committee back in 2018, we went around the province, and we said there has to be more processing. Why would you raise livestock on your little farm if you have a six and a half hour drive to take them somewhere to get them slaughtered and cut and wrapped? So that's why I think our numbers are diminishing because people aren't interested in raising cattle for the fun of it. You're raising some livestock on your farm to make a buck or two but you have to have some processing facilities nearby. And to talk also about uh, um, your hemp, my dad always told me down in South Surrey, White Rock, there's a big old feedlot down there that Jimmy Baird converted to border feedlot. And I said to my dad, what's with all those great big barns? He said, in World War II, they grew hemp in British Columbia, and that hemp went to that facility, and they made it into rope to ship overseas for our fighting soldiers, whatever they use the rope for, but that's what hemp was used for. The only thing, we grew some hemp down in my area in Delta, and it was an extremely difficult crop to harvest. We brought in, you know, disc mowers, sickle bar mowers, harvesters, and it had such a big, heavy stock that nobody could quite figure out how to harvest hemp in big numbers. Okay. Oh. Uh, hi, um, Jennifer Roberts. I um, I'm a cattle rancher in the area. Um, yeah, at least I have confirmed I'm not completely paranoid with feeling that our industry is under attack. Um, 
So I just have a couple of things to bring up, once more of information. So um, the Land Act, it was great to hear the amendment was put on hold, but I think we all know it's just put on hold until after the election because they knew that it would be final nail in their coffin. And I guess what my ask for you guys is, like I found out about it watching Global when some people down in the lower mainland were worried about their losing their docks. And then we were like, what's this about? And then we got, we need, I know you're just in opposition, but we need to know when we need to fight. And this is going to come back, or I'm sh pretty sure it's going to come back if they win the election. And we need, like, we need heads up so we can help fight and say, no, this isn't good for us. So it's just really, you know, giving us a heads up. And then, so we were like, oh, phew, that's gone, so we can breathe easy. And then um, I was just at the ranch and having morning coffee, and it was brought up, uh, application for disposition of crown land. And it came up, it's over 9,000 hectares in three different regions. One is east of Dragon Mountain, and one's at Tenzikit, and one's um, Telegraph Range. And it's disposition of crown land for the investigation of wind power. So, I mean, I don't know exactly what that entails. I just have red flags in saying it can't be good for agriculture, for range, for anybody. So it's just, you know, if somebody can look, like you did such a great job with um, putting a halt on the removal of agriculture into carbon sequester, you know, selling it off to foreign companies. So it's just, you know, it's another concern um, because, yeah, some of the areas um, are so far away from any kind of infrastructure, I don't know what they would be exploring to put at wind towers or any kind of wind energy out at Tenzikit, which is miles away from any kind of um, needed infrastructure. So, um, yeah, I'm hoping things turn around. I'm not extremely hopeful, but, um, yeah, if you guys can just give us a heads up when we need to go and fight. and <laughs> Yeah, well, that's it is just about that, but it becomes, you know, yeah. Jennifer, can I just respond to that? Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, here's my ask, too, is when you're seeing that, can you please... I think a lot of times people assume that we're seeing it all at the same time. And um, if you are seeing that stuff, please let my office know. Uh, because the other challenge that we have a lot of times, our experiences, we used to be able to go to um, our local offices here, like whether it's the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Transportation, the Ministry of Force, we used to have the ability to go and pick up the phone and ask them questions. We are now tasked, if we have any questions, I have to phone the minister's office in Victoria and get permission from their staff to reach out to our local office to get information. And it's getting worse. And the more we ask, then the local staff gets shut down and they're told you're not allowed to talk to the MLA because she's in opposition. And then the challenge becomes we're only going to meet with certain people, but you have to sign a disclosure that you're not going to share the information. If government ever asks you to sign one of those, don't, please. It is getting worse. It's this whole idea of controlling the narrative by controlling any access. And at the end of the day, look, we're all, it doesn't matter. I'm going to get myself into trouble, so I have to always stop and think about it. Look, we're here for the people. Look, I didn't get elected to do this job because I had some grandiose vision about politics. I got involved because quite well, I got involved because we didn't have post-secondary here, and I thought, my God, we should have some services for young people. And I want to applaud you, young lady, for being here today, for having a notebook, and I didn't want to embarrass you. Um, but we're doing this, be and the other young people, we're doing this because we want to make sure that our kids have the same opportunities we have. So my ask is please just let us know. And then sometimes I might just reach out and ask, can you go to this meeting on my behalf and let me know what's going on? Because we're not told. And Linda, you've been 
great not to put you on the spot, but you've been really, really good at providing us information. I also want to recognize, George, you've brought some really important information. Uh, Ian and I sit on a subcommittee of carbon sequestration. It's been a fascinating um, it's been a fascinating subcommittee of government. Um, it's all over the map, but I think we've had some really interesting presentations. You delivered an outstanding presentation around forage and agroforestry and what we need to look at, some common sense solutions to government, which I think is radically important. Um, so with that, please just let us know the information. I'll get back to you on the, the specific question you asked. So the clean energy uh, plan for BC is a gong show. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, in, by 2035, you will not be able to buy a new gasoline or diesel vehicle. The legislation will say all vehicles coming in that must be sold in BC must be electric. By 2030, it'll be 90%. So somebody that wins that lottery, you'll have a 10% chance of buying a gas or diesel truck. I have no idea when you don't have the infrastructure, you don't have the supply. By 2026, 26% 26 of all vehicles sold in BC must be electric. You don't have the supply, you don't have the infrastructure. So the NDP said, we don't need Site C. Then they got elected and said, okay, we need Site C. Let's mismanage it so it goes over budget. The other thing they did was they took away the clean energy plan which was all the windmills and the solar panels you were, you were just talking about, they said, we don't need that. So they took it away. Well, then they found out they need more power. So they brought it back. And that's probably what you got. Somebody's going out there and going to speculate on a large chunk of land. It still stands to be seen whether or not BC Hydro will accept clean energy at their rates. Because if they don't, then the rate payer or the taxpayer will pick up the bill. Just recently, uh, the NDP made an announcement. They're, they're going to actually invest taxpayer money to the tune of $36 billion to upgrade the supply and the infrastructure of BC for electricity. I don't see how they do it. I don't, I, I don't, and plus, at the same time, they're shutting down natural gas use. They're not allowing the Okanagan to use natural gas to supplement electricity. Now you think about this, you all remember when the Enbridge pipeline exploded outside Prince George? Well, what you don't know was that Fortis was told to speed up the repair of that pipeline because the, the, the grid that services the lower mainland was gonna have a blackout. Everybody switched to electricity because they couldn't use natural gas. That's how fragile our system is. And by the way, if you can't accomplish this by the time 2030 rolls around where 90% of the vehicles sold are EVs, you're going to have to buy more electricity from the United States. And they generate electricity using coal. It's not as clean as our electricity. So none of this, none of this actually makes sense. It's all on the seat of their pants, and it's not for your benefit. It's to appease their environmental friends. It doesn't make any sense to us as ratepayers and taxpayers, or even users of electricity. Bernie. Name's Bernie McKinnon. We have a ranch east of Quinnell. Uh, on the wind turbines, they're supposedly going to go on top of Dragon Mountain. Talk into it? How's that? But the second, the one I really wanted to talk about was uh, transitioning a farm from generation to generation is nothing more than a tax grab because you have to have the total value of everything and, and the next generation has to pay the tax on every piece of equipment and market value on the land. It's not an easy transition in what, it, you know, how can a younger generation step in and do this at today's prices? And for the forest industry, 35% of the wood is still left in the bush. Uh, anything less than five inches is burnt in the bush. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Jeff Vanderveen. I'm from Sumas Prairie. Jeff, what are you doing here? 
I moved up here for a different way of life, Mr. Counselor. I lived on a family dairy farm most of my life. Um, my dad retired, handed it off to my siblings. I went and did other things. I ran into an ailment. I overtook my ailment. I went back into dairy farming for five years, and it just wasn't cutting it. Because $400, for, $400 a ton for alfalfa, $1,200 a ton for fertilizer, and then you got to pay your guy. Who's going to make it or break it? Another thing, too, is Cash Creek used to have a slaughterhouse some years back, and it shut down because it didn't meet the quota because there wasn't enough ranchers in this area to bring the meat to Cash Creek. That's why it, that's why it folded. So if we had one up here, if the government funded a slaughterhouse up here, we could have a better way of life up here, too. We could not spend so much money on traveling. So... Thank you very much. Okay. Am I on? Okay. Um, I got a problem with the non-resident foreign ownership of agricultural land. And we've been fighting this, well, personally, I've been fighting this, and Corley knows because... She helped us shut down Rickett Benkiser, which was a British company buying up agricultural land, good alfalfa producing land, bulldozing the, all the infrastructure, turning over that ground and planting trees. And we fought like hell, we got it stopped. But when it comes to asking to limit the um, non resident foreign investment in agricultural land, we got basically no response whatsoever. And I was on a teleconference along with Linda, with the Senate Committee on Agriculture and Forestry, and it brought up the point about this foreign ownership of the agricultural land, and their response was, it's not a problem. We export 47% of our food. And I said, well, yeah, we do that now. What about... 50 years, what about 100 years? You gotta remember, whoever owns that land controls what happens on that land and where the produce or whatever's produced on that land, where it goes. So that is something that I think both our provincial and our federal governments should take a real close look at. And um, one other point that kind of hits me a little bit now is um, where recreation on land, on crown land, seems to trump agriculture. Um, you know, the, the government is great on putting in recreation trails and facilities and that, uh, even pushing out agriculture. We have a case here on our community pasture where they allowed um, a ski club to put a shooting range within our pasture. And you know, um, it's just some of these things that just don't sit well with me. Thank you. Uh, so first off, um, on your comment about non-resident owning, um, so that was one of the first things I, uh, even before I was elected, um, I toured the uh, area of land just uh, north of uh, town here, just below uh, co-op, that down in those flats areas there. I was shocked to see what Ricketts Benheiser was doing, and um, thankfully we had some great MLAs um, that we still do to this day that really took this on and actually fought about for it in Victoria. So I will take that back. I was shocked to hear that. I'm shocked to hear that it's still going on. Um, as far as the slaughterhouse or the processing plant, I don't know whether Jeff is still here or not. Um, I think it was in 2017, uh, I was part of an announcement up in, in Prince George, just outside of Prince George, uh, by the uh, BC Calamans Association was there. Um, I know uh, I was invited not because I was in government of the day, but because in my previous role at the Prince George Airport Authority, we, we, we paid, um, uh, I think it was 
about two hundred thousand dollars for uh, the business case to be developed. Um, and at that time, our the BC Liberals, uh, the government of the day, made the announcement that we were building a facility right there. And so um, I have had this conversation a number of times with our current government, both federal and provincial, as to why we are not, why we haven't um, or, uh, actioned that announcement where they said they were building this facility there. And so I've also talked with Kevin as well too at the BC Cattlemen's Association to see where we're, where we're at. It's something that comes up every, uh, you know, multiple times throughout the year. I don't know why we haven't moved forward with it. I don't think anybody really has an, uh, an answer for me. Maybe, uh, maybe Coralie, you might know more, but that is something that it, it absolutely baffles me and it kills me that we are sending our, our, uh, our, our calves and, um, our livestock south or to Calgary for processing. Um, and, you know, to, to Ian's comment about um, why we are seeing fewer and fewer um, herds out there. Well, because it, it costs too much to to raise them, to, to do it. And there's no money in it for our, for our producers. You know, our, our family uh, was a cow-calf uh, producer as well too, farming family. And, and you know, uh, we're getting out of it. And the reason why is because it's harder and harder to make a buck. It's like we said all along, the common theme that we've said since we started uh, today's town hall is there's been a war in our way of life. And and we just have to turn the tables. And to your comment, um, Jennifer, it's every day. You need to fight every day. It's one thing that I learned up here in the Caribou is that we fight every day and we're good fighters. I have uh, one really quick question. My name's Erin Durrell. Um, I'm a long-time ranching family. I'm from West Williams Lake. My husband and I now ranch southwest of Cornell here. I'm also a member of the Eskadam First Nation. Um, I have a really quick question. I see wind on, or whispers on the wind around um, a vacancy tax on farmland happening you know, on ALR land. Apparently, Premier EB has made an announcement, I believe, at a young farmers convention on the coast, I think, in the fall. And um, I was just reading about it the other day. I don't know um, if if Ian or any of you guys have have anything any more information on that. Well, it's, I believe it's a two percent tax. But my question, I guess, is sort of around what dictates whether it's being used properly for agriculture and who makes that decision. Um, I kind of am not really happy with how the ALR operates because I don't think it always protects agricultural land and hasn't for a long time, but um, I also have questions around how this proposal is going to work because we all kind of know how the vacancy tax on homes works in the province. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It was in Country Life newspaper, I think, just the last issue that just came out. David Eby's talking about a tax on unused farmland, but to this gentleman's comment, you do have a point because um, I don't like to see very productive pieces of farmland, especially in the Fraser Valley, when we're talking, you know, class one, class two black soil, even just up the road from my farm, you know, you get a developer or a real estate person that comes in and buys, for instance, on my farm, on my road, there's 50 acres, um, that one of our neighbors was growing 50 acres of potatoes in it every year, and suddenly for two years in a row, it's had nothing on it. So if you've got protective farmland, uh, the government now has vacancy tax on homes and cottages and stuff like that. So I don't see a big issue with actually, you know, if you are some sort of a real estate developer, leaving a piece of good farmland fallow and nothing's growing on it, then maybe there should be a, a tax on that. Exactly. I just went on the Agricultural Land Commission's... Yeah, okay, I'll talk to you afterwards because I get more information, I'll send it to you for sure. But down on the coast, like if you go on the Agricultural Land Commission's website and look at everything that's in the ALR in BC, it's all in green. And it's amazing how much 
is all over this province. My dad always told me back in 1973, somebody just took a map of BC and a big red felt pen. They go, this is in, this is out, this is in, this is out. There's so much land that's in the ALR that probably shouldn't be in the ALR that's part of your farms that if you could sell off five acres to the wealthy doctor that wants to build a cottage overlooking the lake, you'd have some money to buy a new tractor or buy, build a barn or something like that, but they won't let you do that. And I think that's just wrong. There's, there's land that, that's in the ALR that shouldn't be in the ALR and vice versa. It's very um, uh, tricky situation. So I will um, look into that. The other thing I want to talk about is secondary homes, and I'll quickly say that I'm a believer that if you're a bona fide farming family in this province, we need to allow the next generation that's coming along to be able to live on the farm and work with grandma and grandpa or the parents or whatever it is. And this idea of one principal residence and suddenly they're pounding their chest, the NDP going, oh, we're gonna allow you a second residence now in BC. It's 90 meters squared, which is 970 square feet. I mean, if you've got a, a son and daughter-in-law with three kids, 970 square feet is not a very big house. Give an example, up in Smithers, I've been up there, there's like 10 dairy farms in Smithers and we got family members that want to be part of that farm. They're married with kids, and they're commuting from an apartment in downtown Smithers to the dairy farm 25 kilometers away. There's just something very, very wrong with that. So if you're a bona fide farming family, not some developer or, or a doctor or lawyer that bought a piece of farmland, but if you're a bona fide farming family making a living farming, we have to allow for some more houses for family members and hired help to be on those farms. <laughs> so we've got two more questions. We were supposed to be done at five because we have to switch out to get into it. So we've got two more quest questions. We'll take them back and then maybe we can even answer them offline um, just to help uh, move out this room into a new room. So, yes. Hi, I'm Dallas Fitchett. We ranch just south of town here. We used to run 300 cows. We sold a bunch this year because of the drought. I know that's not the government's problem. I don't think they need to help me out there other than the red tape and taxes just get in the way of doing business they get in the way of passing the farm to my daughters like this gentleman mentioned it gets in the way of them being able to buy land and get ahead and the government bureaucracy just from seeing what's going on both federally and provincially is out of control and I think that involves both parties I think it's a lame excuse just to blame the other party all the time but that's mostly what I want to bring up is the red tape is out of control. I try and do my stuff so I don't get land from the government. I don't have to go to them for anything. And I'm not here to blame you guys for what you're doing, but you're making it extremely hard to do any kind of business in BC, whether it is farming or any small business that, uh, yeah, not too many questions, but just the way I feel here. And I don't see a lot changing. I'm disappointed in how the news gets to us. We find it in the paper. I write you guys, I write other people, I try and stay active and fight. And then you watch people that do protest and what happens to them in Canada. It's a bunch of nonsense. People, when they went to Ottawa, whether you agree or not, what happened to them wasn't fair. What they're doing in Europe, we'll see what happens to those guys. It's happening all over the world. And it's uh, pretty disappointing. And uh, yeah, it's gonna be tough for our kids to I know my daughters probably won't be ranching here. That's just the way it is. I'll make this quick. When I was a young guy growing up, uh, we always had what's called district agriculturists that represented the areas. And those were the people that would come, sit down at the kitchen table, Mom would put on the pot of coffee and they would help the farmer with paperwork, permits, all those different things. And we've got a total lack of extension services in this province for people. And we also have a total lack of internet service, cell phone service. There's people told they need to register their wells, they need to get permits for this, permits and that. Do it online. They don't have online if you're outside of Fort St. John or you're way up in Fort Nelson or somewhere. So I, I totally agree with you, totally agree. Hi, my name is Thomas, um, dairy farm just north of town. I brought my daughter here. She was uh, really quite excited when I mentioned this. So, um, I want to actually bring it back down a little bit, down to the farm level. A lot of the talk today was probably a little more macro, probably a little more 20 years down the road type of thing. Today what we're facing on our farms is very much 
cost of production and everything else that gets in the way of it. Um, when I sit down and I look at my books and I look at your interest rate and we've all been told the you know, fantasy that rates for low for long kind of thing, right? And uh, we're a little bit caught up paying probably pretty high amounts right now. Um, I don't ask that you guys fix our problems. I don't ask that you guys hold our hands or give us handouts or anything along those lines. What I do ask, though, is that you take a look at what's actually happening in our businesses, and whether that's agriculture or anything else. And you change your default answer to yes. When we go and ask for a permit to do something, whether it's for groundwater or whether it's for building a barn or, or, or cutting a tree, the default answer should be yes. And it should be up to you to tell us why we can't, not why we are suddenly allowed to. And it's all these little things. It's the death by a thousand cuts. If all it was is that our BC Hydro rate went up 5%, well, we, we could probably eat that, right? And if minimum wage goes up a buck, yeah, we, we could probably eat that. But it's everything, and it's on and on and on. And when you go from having a 10% margin to a 4% margin now to a minus 5% margin, you can't make your debt service coverage ratios and all that sort of stuff, right? Then you start seeing the banks come calling and the lawyers and all that sort of stuff. And I like to think that I'm sort of in the prime of it right now. And I sometimes wonder, well, will they? And I sit down and I think, okay, like, how, how do we do things different? How do we do things so that like I'm more efficient or what I do is more valuable every hour I spend on the tractor or every hour I spend in the milking parlor or something along those lines, right? Like how do, how do we make it better? And I'm doing everything I can to make it better for me and for my kids. And I need you guys to go back and I need you guys to look at it and say, well, how come those sets of tires that that truck that's bringing my grain or bringing my fertilizer, how come they're $600 each? Right? Like, that's nuts. How come the roads are, like, sometimes in some places in mediocre states that they can't even get in or get out? You know, you, I try to buy grain out of Dawson Creek. They can't even get into the farm to pick up a load of grain to bring it to me. I'm a willing buyer. You got a willing seller, and you guys are standing in the way. Right? And we, we spend all this money, and we do all these things. I'm not against taxes. I like the nice new hospital and all that sort of stuff, too. But you got to cut 1% here and 2% there, and you just got to make it a little bit easier for everybody along the way so that when she sits down, hopefully sometime, take over the books, and she's like, okay, there's something here, right? All the talk of changing the ALR and, and second jobs and all that sort of stuff, like you're missing the point. The point is, is that that should be a choice, not a necessity. If you want to be a full-time farmer and make a living full-time farming, well, don't make that impossible. Make it a reality. Make it so that a small farm can become a medium farm, can become a large farm, whatever they want to do. But, like, all the little things, then you just get a little disheartened after a while. So I ask that you guys just cut 1% here, 2% there, and the default answer should be yes. Without a doubt. Thank you. And by the way, that's what we say. In fact, it shouldn't take an MLA like myself to write a letter to the government to say, this person has done everything they could possible to fill out your form for the permit. How come you don't get it? Why don't you give them the permit? This is what I find out that I'm doing more often than not. Citizens, loggers, miners are doing everything that the government tells them to do. And the only thing government should do, just issue the permit. But they won't do it. You know what the, the, the government's answer is? We'll hire more staff to make sure that they review this permit. 36% increase in your provincial government. That is the largest payroll in BC history. And permits are still not being issued. It's not just for agriculture, it's for farming, it's for mining, it's across the board. And 
you go up to peace, they can't get gas out of the ground. You come to my territory, they can't get a Ministry of Highways permit so they can start building McDonald's. And the only way we find out is the person writing the application brings into our office, they shows us all the paperwork they went through, and they can't get a permit signed. Three months later, we go down to Victoria, pound the table. How come you're not giving this guy a permit? How come you're not giving this woman a permit? Oh, it takes the minister to come down and sign it and say, okay, it only took 20 seconds. It's approved. It shouldn't be like that. The process should actually benefit the person that's filling out the application. I mean, all this stuff, all this bureaucracy that everybody's talking about in terms of cutting red tape, that really means just sign the permit. All the statutory requirements are there for a reason. I get it. We're trying to protect the environment, trying to protect safety. We're trying to protect health. We're, but we're doing that. So why isn't government issuing the permits? They just don't care about the permits. They care about hiring more staff. In fact, there will be more staff hired this year from the announcements we heard. Sir, I see my staff starting to try and get us. I, I am going to have to close this portion down, but we do have another one, and we'll be here um, just because we have to clean out and set up um, for the next one. Um, but Thomas, just I guess in, in response, um, I'm not used to being so emotional in front of a crowd, and it's certainly not something, you know, it's embarrassing for me to stand before you all and be emotional. And it's because I know how much it counts. I know how much it matters. And we're fighting like hell. I need all of you to know that we're really fighting. And it's hard because they're not listening. And I don't know what else we do. And to the point is, we all need to start standing up. And I'm asking you, like, we're trying as individuals to be in Victoria and Ottawa. And we're sh shouting at the top of our lungs, and yet we're not being heard. And I know that that message isn't getting back here because the media isn't covering in Victoria what we're saying because we just don't matter to them. But I want each of you to know when you're leaving today that we're trying and we're bringing people in, and we're trying our best to get your message out there, and we're going to continue to fight like hell. And I guess in closing, our ask is we're asking you to join us because we need some help. So thanks for coming today, guys.